Thanks for joining us for this archive of the first episode in our Presidential Elections and Campaigns, What Can We Learn from History webinar series. The focus of today's program was the tumultuous election of 1800 between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Today we were joined by Dr. Jeff Sikinga, Professor of Political Science at Ashland University and the Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and Dr. Cara Rogers of Ashland University. Thanks for listening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Oh, welcome to our webinar, Presidential Elections, What Can We Learn from History? I'm Jeff Sikinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, which is an independent educational center located at Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio. Uh, thank you for joining us for this event, which uh, is co-sponsored by Missouri Humanities. who has been a wonderful partner in this webinar and in the series that will follow. Um, the, the Ashbrook Center, uh, for those of you who may not know, is an independent educational center that specializes in the teaching and education in American history and government. We run programs both at Ashland University, but also around the country for students, for teachers, and for citizens. And this webinar is one of those programs. We're delighted to have you join us, whether you're in the great state of Missouri or anywhere around the country. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're welcoming citizens with us this evening. We're also, of course, welcoming teachers who may be joining us through our Teaching American History program, which is a project of the Ashbrook Center. And these are, again, part of our programs which go around the country, helping uh, students, teachers, and citizens to discover for themselves the story of America. You know, it's Ashbrook's mission to restore and strengthen constitutional self-government in America by educating our fellow Americans in the history and principles of our country and in the habits necessary for self-government. That's what we do. That's what we're all about at Ashbrook. And we really think that that education in American principles and history is best done by uh, uh, the Ashbrook way of teaching and learning, which is understanding education not as information and not certainly as indoctrination, but as discovery. Thinking and discovering for yourself the truth about America. So we, we base all our programs, this webinar and everything else we do on Aristotle's old idea, all people desire to know, but then we add, but they don't want to be told. They want to discover it for themselves. And we think a great way to do that is through conversation. Conversation with the past, where we ask it questions and we listen intently for its answers, rooted in primary historical documents from the past that, that can speak to us if we ask it the right questions. And conversation with each other. So I'm gonna be having this conversation this evening on the, the really interesting and important, and I think in many ways still relevant, election of 1800 with um, professor Carr Rogers, who is a professor of history at Ashland University, my colleague at the university. Uh, Dr. Rogers received her bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. And I think, interestingly, not just in history, or maybe not even in history, but in English. So she has a, 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 a flair and a, and a taste for the written word and for texts. And, and she brings that um, develop sense of the importance of text to her study of history. She went on to receive her master's from the University of Texas and then her PhD from Rice University in Texas. Uh, Dr. Rogers teaches uh, a number of classes, uh, early American history, uh, colonial America. Uh, she teaches in our master's program as well, which we run through the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. And there she's, she's taught classes, again, in colonial America and on her particular area of expertise, which is a really interesting topic. It's Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia. I, if I'm right, I think it's the only book that Jefferson ever published. And so of all of his writings, this is the one where we see Jefferson perhaps um, expanding the most on what he thinks published back during the days of the American Revolution, but had a long and interesting historical career in America, shaping American discourse. And that's the subject of uh, Professor Rogers' historical inquiries. She's a real expert on Thomas Jefferson. She knows him backwards and forwards. 
um, good points, bad points, and everything in between. And of course, the election of 1800, in which Jefferson is the victor. So we thought we would take some time to talk a little bit about that, that really pivotal moment in American history, the election of 1800, what we can learn from it, and what we can insights that might help us think about even presidential elections today in 2020. So Cara, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I thought in the spirit of kind of getting us off started, if, if you wouldn't mind just kind of taking us back, some of us know a fair bit about um, 1800 in those times, but some of us maybe don't know as much. Just take us back, if you don't mind, to maybe the decade of 1800 or just before in the 1790s. You know, because we sometimes think that apart from the Civil War, that the country has never been more politically divided than it is in 2020. But history shows us, I think, that America has been riven with political conflict and partisan fighting before, even way back at the beginning of our republic. So take us back to that time, if you would, and set the table for us, because I want to talk tonight. The broad question, I think, is, you know, what's the significance of the election of 1800 mm. for America? What does it show us about America, American history, American ideas, American principle? But to do that, take us back to that time before 1800. What's going on in the country in the 1790s leading up to that election? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you for having me here to have this uh, conversation tonight. The election of 1800 is actually one of my favorite things to think about when I am feeling particularly discouraged about current events and uh, our, our current political climate. And it seems like every election I get a little bit downhearted and a little bit discouraged. And so it's good for me personally to go back to the election of 1800. This was really America's first truly partisan election. And the partisan division in the nation at that time was definitely as strong as it is today, I would say. The, the levels of high feeling, the threats of secession, rumors of violence, um, armed resistance if the wrong person were to be elected, backdoor dealings, backstabbings, it's all there in the election of 1800, along with some particularly vicious attacks, personal attacks on the people running for office. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But it, it was a really significant moment in American history because prior to this, the elections hadn't been that exciting. And George Washington, of course, is our nation's first president. He had been unanimously elected in 1788 and then reelected. And uh, in 1796, Washington waited until kind of fairly late in the game to announce his retirement. And by doing so, you, you could argue he was almost able to anoint his vice president, John Adams, to take over for him. Uh, and Thomas Jefferson ran against John Adams in that election, but Jefferson was very content to be the vice president. In fact, he said if there was a tie in the election of 1796, Jefferson would rather that John Adams became president because John Adams had seniority, he deserved it. Jefferson wanted to, to take the back seat and, and just be vice president. So the election of 1800 is the first time that there's a real contest between two distinct parties with distinct visions for America's future. Uh, and these two distinct political parties, I'll, I'll just kind of describe them in their fundamentals and we can get more in detail uh, in the next few minutes. But uh, on the one side, you have the Democratic Republicans. They are the good guys, if you like Thomas Jefferson, because that's the party of Thomas Jefferson. It's also associated with James Madison. And then in the other corner, you have the Federalists. The Federalists are associated um, first and foremost with George Washington, but really the mover and shaker of the Federalist Party is Alexander Hamilton, Washington's right-hand man. And then John Adams, as the president in the late 1790s, also becomes the, the head or, or a head, a figurehead for the Federalist Party. The Federalists mostly are made up out of Congregationalists, Episcopalians, 
banking and merchant interests, and they're located typically in New England and on the Atlantic seaboard. Not always, there are some Southern Federalists, but if you had to locate them to a region, you would, you would primarily associate Federalists with the Northeast. Then you have the Republican Party. They tend to be more Baptist or Methodist leaning, tend to be made up out of rich Southern planters and also small farmers. And again, primarily located in the South, but you're gonna find uh, Republicans in the North as well. Uh, and then, as, as we said, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison are the leaders of this party. Now, in the election of 1800, each side believes that nothing less than the future of America is at stake, and that if the other side wins, it will be a disaster of epic proportions. I mean, the Federalists are terrified of Thomas Jefferson. There are stories about Thomas Jefferson being a radical Jacobin, a French revolutionary who's going to bring the guillotine and put it in the middle of the town square and there's going to be blood running in the streets. He's going to bring anarchy to the nation if Jefferson is elected. Whereas Jefferson and his followers believe the Federalists want nothing less than to establish a monarchy, overturn all of the work of the American Revolution, establish a tyrannical regime, um, and use force against the people who oppose them to suppress their freedoms. So, so, so if I can, what, how do we get to that point? I mean, what happens in the 1790s? Because you have John Adams. I mean, you have George Washington. You have Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton. All four of these really important founders all play a role in the American Revolution. They all play a role in the events after that in the 1780s. These are people who were comrades in arms. They knew each other. Um, they, they subscribed to the same revolutionary cause, right? They put their necks on the line in, in the revolution. They really were brothers in, in arms in many ways. And then you have people like James Madison who join in later. You know, we all think of them as founding fathers. And we all kind of say that as though they all agree on things, they all share fundamental beliefs and they all say, you know, slap each other on the back and say, yeah, that's great. We did this with Britain. How do we get to this point in the 1790s where um, the founding fathers who were united in this revolutionary cause really in the 1790s start to split apart? I mean, they even agree on a constitution. But since right after that, in the 1790s, things start to split. Whereas you say you get to the point where it's 1800, it looks like it's a, a struggle for the soul of the country. How do we get there in the 1790s? Yeah, such a great question. I mean, the Revolutionary War unifies the Founding Fathers because, of course, they have a common enemy. And they also, according to Thomas Jefferson, remembering in 1825, 26, back in 1776, America has a common mind. Americans are, are unified in a lot of their, um, their ideals, their principles, the Declaration of Independence being the expression of this. They share the same Protestant religion, by and large. They share a language. They have similar colonial experiences. They all agree that they need to be independent. And George Washington is able to unify them through the war years and preside over the Constitutional Convention and really keep them together. But even with George Washington as president, these deep fissures become apparent in the early years of the 1790s because really these founding fathers are not a monolithic group. They have different personalities. Uh, many of them are just geniuses. And so they have brilliant ways of seeing the world, but in many ways they're deeply contradictory. So for example, the founding fathers differed on human nature. Should we op be optimistic about the possibilities for human nature, or should we be, pe be pessimistic and design governments that are big and strong enough to control people? Uh, they differed on whether a big republic or a small republic would be the best. They differed on whether the power concentrated in the hands of the federal government was, was the right way to go, or if we needed to keep power concentrated in the hands of the state governments or, or the local level. So if you're gonna get into the, the nitty gritty, um, Jefferson being the leader of the uh, Democratic Republicans. Let's, let's take him for example. Jefferson's an optimist. He's an idealist, he's an optimist. He believes human beings share uh, a common moral sense. We have a conscience, 
that leads us toward doing the right thing, toward caring for one another. He believes the American Republic will work because we will care for one another. We can uh, develop our affection for one another. And if we educate the populace and we encourage virtue in the populace, Americans are only going to become more and more virtuous and moral over time and more and more capable of self-government. So Jefferson trusts the people and he's uh, not looking toward a large national government or federal government to, to do much work. He wants to keep as much power as he can uh, dispersed because he's trusting of the abilities of individuals to handle this. Jefferson's vision of America's future is agricultural. He thinks cities corrupt people and introduce vice. So keep everybody living in rural communities. Commerce can be the handmaiden of agriculture, um, but we're gonna let the farmers lead the way. Small government, low taxes, no army needed. We're gonna be at peace with everybody. Hamilton, on the other hand, has this vision of America's future that is incredibly uh, prophetic, really, if you look at the way that we've ended up. Hamilton saw us as a world power. Hamilton saw America's future based in commercial enterprise and manufacturing. Hamilton believed America needed to become a world power, able to compete militarily and economically with the old world, with England, with France. Um, but this uh, beautiful vision that Hamilton has for America's future is also closely connected to his deep pessimism about human nature. Hamilton thinks people are inherently selfish and self-interested. And government's job is really to inject some corruption into the way that government works and into a relationship between government and individuals in order to manipulate individuals' self-interested nature to get them to act in their own best interests and in the best interests of the community at large. So for Hamilton, uh, we're going to keep the government together by, for example, creating a national bank and getting the wealthiest uh, individuals to invest in this bank. And they're therefore going to support the government because their financial interests are secured in supporting the federal government. And Hamilton believed the elite classes uh, had kind of control and influence over the lower levels of society. They would be able to bring those people along and, and draw them into supporting the federal government as well if Hamilton was able to secure the top levels of society. So these two very contrasting pictures of, of human nature, I think just give us a, a small glimpse into only two of the founding fathers, the ways in which they disagreed um, moving forward into the 1790s. Well, so that's, those are big differences. Those are serious differences. And even if the revolution holds them together um, at the beginning, with those kind of differences, um, it, isn't it right that that at, at least in Washington's early cabinet in the 1790s that both Hamilton and Jefferson are in the cabinet? And so Washington, is it right in the 1790s, Washington is president, Hamilton's tre tre secretary, secretary of the Treasury, um, Jefferson is secretary of state, and they're in the cabinet together. They have these really competing visions of what America should be like in the future. Washington Am I right? It seems like it's right to say Washington, by the strength of his personality and his character, sort of holds that together for a while. But we've even got questions already coming in, folks wanting to know, so how did these parties start developing in the 1790s? How did they get organized? You know, Washington, on the surface, it looks like everybody's united, but below the surface, you're telling us they're already starting to develop these competing visions, and they begin to realize they need to get organized politically in order to combat the other side. So tell us a little bit about the about Washington's cabinet, about Jefferson and Hamilton, and even Adams, who was vice president. Tell us, tell us about that and how the political parties start getting organized, because they seem really important for understanding the election of 1800. Yeah, so the, the political parties, it's fascinating to look at the way that they develop over this time period. It's almost a series of, of accidents or a series of, of choices for which the ramifications couldn't be foreseen at the time. So, for example, uh, the uh, Hamiltonian side, the Federalist side, was represented by a newspaper. 
Uh, it's been started in 1789. It was called the Gazette of the United States. It was run by an editor named uh, Fenno, F-E-N-N-O. And Fenno was supported by Alexander Hamilton's Treasury Department. Uh, the Treasury Department subsidized Fenno's newspaper. And initially, this newspaper's job was to encourage people to support the Constitution. But as Jefferson uh, Jefferson had been off in France, being America's minister to France. He came back in 1789 and joined the cabinet, got to know Hamilton, and started to think to himself, yeah, this Hamilton guy, I'm a little scared of some of his ideas. He sounds like a monarchist. Hamilton, in fact, uh, the more that Jefferson started to get to know him in conversations in cabinet, Hamilton would say things like, oh, my hero is Julius Caesar. And, and Jefferson's heroes were Bacon, Locke, and, uh, and Newton. And, and Hamilton said, well, those are nice heroes, but I think Julius Caesar is the best guy ever to have lived. And Hamilton said things like, oh, the British constitution, even with its corruption, is the best constitution imaginable. And Jefferson starts to really worry that Hamilton is leading the country in the wrong direction. And so Jefferson and his co cohort, his, uh, his compadre Madison, decide to found a newspaper that will better represent their perspective on domestic events. So they found a newspaper very confusingly called the National Gazette, uh, and it's edited by a guy named Freno. So you have Fenno on the one hand and Freno on the other hand, and Freno's National Gazette starts attacking Fenno and his Gazette of the United States. Hamilton starts writing directly, uh, usually using a pseudonym, but, but writing pieces that are published in his newspaper and Madison and Jefferson recruit individuals to write in the, the, mag in the journal or the, the newspaper that's representing their perspective. And this, I think, is a real uh, engine for partisanship that starts early on, and, and the individuals couldn't have foreseen the, the role that the press would play in our political climate. But uh, that definitely happens early in the 1790s. The other big reason why these divisions form among the founding fathers isn't even an American reason, it's France. The French Revolution begins in 1789, and initially all Americans support this, they think this is a great step forward. France had been our allies in our own revolution, we're supporting their chance at getting a more free constitution for themselves. But by the 1792, and it's particularly getting into 1793, the French Revolution is getting more and more violent, more and more extreme, perhaps headed toward anarchy. And the Federalists, Washington, Adams, Hamilton, are deeply concerned that Jefferson and Jefferson's followers are not taking the threat of the more radical impulses, the more democratic impulses of the French Revolution seriously enough. And so this becomes a, a really deep reason for division between these men, that uh, Jefferson is worried that Hamilton and the Federalists are too loyal to England and want to return us to monarchy, and Jefferson is, is wanting to support the French Revolution. Hamilton and his allies are terrified that Jefferson and Madison and their friends are too naive about the French Revolution. And, and there is even some evidence for that, some support for that notion of Jefferson. And you gave us a, a document to look at, Thomas Jefferson's letter to Elbridge Gerry, mm -hmm. um, for which we have the name gerrymandering, right? G G Congressional districts comes from Elbridge Gerry. But I was just looking at an interesting quote there. Um, Jefferson's letter, he says this to Elbridge Gerry. He says, um, this is on the third page. He says, to these I will add that I was a, I was a sincere well-wisher to the success of the French Revolution and still wish it may end in the, in the establishment of a free and well-ordered republic. So even as late as 1799, which by that time Napoleon is about to take over in France, um, if he's not already underway, um, you still have Jefferson saying, yeah, that French Revolution, I f it was fundamentally a good thing. So that really does seem to play an important role in the divisions that happen in America in the 1790s. Absolutely. For Jefferson, if the French Revolution doesn't succeed, republicanism itself may as well be doomed. You know, if, if the example of the Americans and their revolution cannot be um, kind of copied and cannot play out in other locations, and France is seven times the size of America. If the French can succeed at, at 
overthrowing their ancient monarchy and establishing a more free and equal government, that Jefferson is just uh, it's a game changer. World history forever will be different. So he is, he is just determined until the absolute final moments to support this revolution. And eventually, he does start to realize that perhaps his devotion to that revolution was a bit blind. He left before the real violence began. And so he just could never quite picture how bloody and brutal it, it became. And he just stayed optimistic about it. So yeah, he says here in this, in this letter, you're absolutely right. I still hope that it's going to be ending up well. But he does defend himself then of the accusation that perhaps he was more loyal to France than he was to America. And that's because by the end of the 1790s, France and America had become enemies. The, the radical French uh, government had um, started attacking American ships. We were involved in a, what we call a quasi-war on the seas with France. Uh, and so even, even the most loyal Francophiles had to back away from their support of the revolution for that reason. So this must have paint this development of political parties, and we've got a, a wonderful question about this coming from a, mem a participant uh, who wants to know, that said, "Look, didn't this must have pained George Washington? Because didn't he, in his farewell address, warn against political parties and say we've got to really be worried about political parties getting organized that don't bring people together but pull them apart and tear the country apart? And but yet political parties start developing right on his watch as president." in the 1790s, and they're not originating from outside his government, but from cabinet members inside his government. Must have pained him. Oh, absolutely. I think it pained him. I think it was a source of tremendous frustration to him that he loved, that's not too strong a word, but he, he cared deeply for, at the very least, both Hamilton and Jefferson, and to see them constantly at each other's throats and to turn away from purely political debate to personal attack and, and hatred of each other even, I think was distressing to Washington to have to witness. And he, uh, Jefferson finally said that that's it, I'm, I'm leaving Washington or I'm, I'm leaving the capital city. I don't want to be part of this. I want to retire as secretary of state. And Washington pleaded with Jefferson to stay around uh, to show the country an example of, of solid leadership that did not allow personal disputes and, and partisan conflict to tear apart the, the government. And Jefferson stuck around until uh, the end of a year. And then he said, that's it, I'm, I'm retiring early. I'm going home to Monticello. So yes, this was sad for Washington. And I don't think it's a coincidence that by the time we get to the election of 1800, Washington had just passed away. And this really marks the end of an era that the father is dead. And now it's up to the sons to fight it out and see which vision for the future is going to carry the day. So this, these political divisions and parties have developed. They have their own newspapers. So, so the idea of some people might say the modern equivalent of, of you know, media outlets that are going after each other and clearly have a certain point of view, it's nothing new. <laughs> it goes all the way back to, to this time in America. You've got newspapers that are like openly the organs of pol political parties, and they're really attacking the others. That's happening. But yet um, John Adams gets elected, as you said. Jefferson is willing to be vice president. He doesn't apparently fight that too hard. And we have this unusual system then electing president, right? First person who gets the most electoral votes is president. If you get the second most, you become vice president. So necessarily opponents are going to be <laughs> vice president and vice president. Um, but you get that, you get that election. What happens then when, in the Adams administration? Yeah. Does the political tension intensify? What happens so leading up to this years of, of 1800? Right. So Adams wins this election and Adams makes a big mistake. Adams keeps George Washington's cabinet. He makes no changes among his closest advisors. And maybe what Adams doesn't fully recognize is that George Washington's cabinet is more interested in what Alexander Hamilton has to say even though Alexander Hamilton has gone off to practice law in New York City, the, the cabinet is more loyal to Hamilton than they are to Adams. And so this starts a period where Adams becomes increasingly um, separated from the hardcore, we call them high federalist wing of the party led by Hamilton. Adams' goal for his administration becomes not going to war with France. 
So I mentioned earlier that by this point, the French have taken up a more aggressive position toward the United States. Uh, the French believe that, that the United States should be more loyal to the French than to the English. The French and English are by now engaged in their own conflict. And this puts the United States in a difficult position. Under Washington, we issued our neutrality proclamation. We said we don't want to get involved. Adams still wants there to not be a conflict because he does not believe America is ready to enter into another war uh, so soon after the American Revolution. Uh, but Hamilton, Hamilton is a little bit less uh, cautious. Hamilton is actually aiming for America to have a large standing army. And by the uh, 1798, Hamilton has gotten it right to get through Congress a, a permanent military force of 30,000 troops under the command ostensibly of George Washington, but he's you know, in retirement. So really, it's Alexander Hamilton's army uh, that is marshaled, that is going to defend America in the event that France attacks us. So Hamilton it has an army. Adams is attempting to uh, keep the peace with France, but the French, uh, quite stupidly, refuse to meet with uh, American ministers to France unless American pays a bribe, gives them loan. This is known as the XYZ affair. And Adams lets this be known to the American public. The French are dealing falsely with us. They want to bribe us. And this really turns American public opinion against the French. Uh, Jefferson, of course, thinks the whole thing is exaggerated. He doesn't think the French government would really do something like that. But the rest of the country is quite angry at the French. So the XYZ affair kind of galvanizes the nation uh, against the French and, and maybe toward putting us on a better military footing. And then Adams makes his second huge mistake. He goes along with a series of four laws called the Alien and Sedition Acts. And these, uh, you all uh, have them in your document packet. They're really kind of remarkable. One of these acts is still in effect today. It's the Alien Enemies Act, which gives the President of the United States authority to deport um, citizens of a country that we are at war with or that there's a threat of war with. But the other laws uh, are no longer in effect. One of them made it uh, so that you had to be a resident of the United States for 14 years before you could be a citizen and vote in any upcoming elections. Previously, it was only five years. So this is a big change. Uh, then there was a law that made it possible for the president of the United States to deport any alien citizen whom he suspected of uh, sedition, disloyalty, treason, whether or not we were at war with that person's country. Uh, this was believed to be an, an attempt to attack any French person in the United States, whether or not they were loyal to France. And then the, the most controversial of these is the fifth one, the uh, what we now call the Sedition Act. So it's, uh, if you look in the documents that we sent out, it's the last one of these acts, and it's section two is the part that really, really uh, probably sticks out to us today as the, the worst. This says that if any person shall write print, utter, or publish, or shall cause or procure to be written, printed, uttered, or published, or shall knowingly and willingly assist or aid in writing, printing, uttering, or publishing any false, scandalous, and malicious writing or writings against the government of the United States, or either House of the Congress, or the President, with intent to defame the said government, et cetera, et cetera, or to bring uh, them into contempt or disrepute, or to excite against them the hatred of the good people of the United States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, if you criticize Adams or Congress, you go to jail for two years and or have a $2,000 fine. Now, you'll notice and, if you read- And both Adams and, federal, and both Adams and the Congress at that time, right, in 1790, are federalist. Is that right? That's exactly right. Uh -huh. And you'll, you'll notice there that it doesn't mention the vice president. As, as a member of this protected class. Jefferson is the vice president. So it's cool to say malicious, false, horrible things about him, but not about Adams or the Congress. So this is known as the Sedition Act, and it was seen at the time and still today as a blatant partisan attempt to shut down criticism um, coming from the Democratic Republicans. Now, Adams and his party justified this by believing that 
there was a real danger of war with France, and that in a time of war, you need to control what uh, sorts of things are being published. But to Jefferson, and particularly to the 20 some editors of newspapers, Jeffersonian newspapers who were prosecuted under this, it seems like an attack on free speech. Uh, and of course, that's exactly what it was. It was an unconstitutional attack on free speech. And it expired on the day that John Adams left office. So this was uh -huh. a mistake on Adams's part, for sure. And, but, the, but the Federalists in Congress, someone wanted to know, how in the world did Congress pass such a thing? As you say, it was because it was the Federalists were in power. They were united on this. And they were really concerned from their point of view uh, that this, this French revolutionary um, argument, belief, zeal would be spread by the poisonous Republican, Democratic Republican newspapers and, and speakers. And they would have, they had to shut that down because of the tension with France, right? That's their argument. It's a kind of a national security argument. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's a, it's a national security argument that keeps one of these laws on the books. Although uh, Representative Ilhan Omar introduced a law in January to um, to get rid of the Alien Enemies Act, but as far as I know, that hasn't uh, hasn't gone anywhere yet. So yeah. So 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 that's interesting. So so at, at first it looks like then that Adams has public opinion with him heading toward 1800, but because of the Alien Sedition Acts, does it? You said it was a big mistake. Is, are you, do you mean it backfired on him? It, it, what, it, what effect did it have on the country in, as we move now right up to 1800? Absolutely. It backfired. It looked like uh, an overreach of federal power. It gave the federal government authority to come into the states and prosecute individuals in the states for criticizing Adams. Uh, I don't know if I still have the quote, but, but one individual who was, who was imprisoned for criticizing Adams, all he said was he believed Adams was, um, he had unbounded thirst for ridiculous pomp, foolish adulation, and self-avarice. And for that, he got sentenced to prison. Uh, that was Representative Matthew Lyon of Vermont, uh, who went to jail. And he got reelected while he was in jail because his constituents still supported him. So in a way, this a, a lot of politicians would be in jail today if you could be put in jail for that. <laughs> Can you imagine? Absolutely. Yeah. So it has. But so what effect does it have in galvanizing the, the support for the Democratic Republican Party and then for, for Thomas Jefferson? Uh, well, so Jefferson is, of course, horrified. And he and Madison uh, both anonymously compose uh, the Virginia and the Kentucky resolutions. So documents that would be adopted by the Virginia Assembly, the Kentucky House of Representatives, uh, basically putting forth the idea that when the federal government acts in an unconstitutional manner, the executive branch and the, and the legislator act in an unconstitutional manner, the states maybe need to interpose and raise, raise questions and Jefferson even threw out the word nullify uh, those unconstitutional laws. So there's real pushback from uh, several states that, that believe that Adams has just, he's, he's headed toward the tyranny of a monarch. We've strayed too far from the values of the American Revolution. Um, and it also backfires because the Jeffersonian newspapers don't shut up. In fact, by the time of the election, there are more uh, Jeffersonian newspapers than there were when this act was passed. So uh, public opinion kind of surges against Adams for this. The other yeah, thing, and, yeah, I was going to say, in fact, it seems like that view is vindicated later. Someone in the chat asked, you, you said it was a blatantly unconstitutional act. And someone said, did, did courts ever strike it down? And we into the, when we get to the 20th century in 1964, the Supreme Court says, oh, and by the way, the Sedition Act was unconstitutional, just in case anybody <laughs> was still thinking along those lines. I'm but glad you made it, that clear. <laughs> but it doesn't shut up the, the, the press that becomes even as you're saying sort of more partisan and more boisterous in favor of Thomas Jefferson and his party. So we coming up into 1780, 1798, 1799, seems like it's pretty obvious Jefferson's gonna run for president. It seems like his party is pretty energized by this. What happens when we get to the year of 1800? And, and what are the issues that are driving the, the election? Is it just all about the French Revolution and the Alien Sedition Acts? 
or are there other really important issues that are part of this? And kind of take us through that year of 1800 and the election. Yeah. Well, by 1800, Adams has done something that he himself was, was justly proud of, felt like he did the right thing, and he, I think he definitely deserves credit. Adams made sure that uh, some new peace commissioners got sent to France. And uh, unfortunately, Adams appointed these peace commissioners, and then he left the capital city and went home, and Hamilton managed to delay the peace commissioners for quite a while. Uh, but eventually, Adams got them sent off, got them over to France. Uh, the French, by this time, uh, as you mentioned, Napoleon is coming into power, is willing to negotiate, and the French extend peace. So the quasi-war ends, uh, and this takes away a big uh, reason why people had been supporting the Federalist Party and had been supporting the idea of Alexander Hamilton having his own little mini army. So Hamilton gets his army taken away from him, and there's now a real split in between the Federalist Party. There are people who are more moderate, people like Elbridge Gerry, people like John Adams, who are wanting to avoid war, uh, de-escalate the situation, and then Hamilton really becomes more and more extreme uh, in pursuit of a bit of an empire. He starts talking about maybe signing a, a some kind of an alliance with the British, maybe invading South America, America needing to expand its territory. He's going further than what Adams is comfortable with. Adams uh, fires two of his cabinet members who had been loyal to Hamilton, and uh, kind of as retaliation for this and for losing his army, Hamilton publishes a pamphlet just attacking John Adams. And this really breaks down the, the support that had been there between those two men permanently. So the Federalists are divided. There's no longer a war with the French. And this changes things leading up to, to these months of the election of 1800 in, in ways that help the Jeffersonians, definitely. So what are the major issues then? We, you know, we tend to think that the, you laid it out, the parties were kind of regionally based. And we even have that today, right? We have parties, you know, uh, the Democratic Party has strongholds in certain states, Republican Party in some states are sort of, you know, purple states, close states. Um, what are some of the other important issues? So, for example, a number of folks have asked in the chat, what about the issue of slavery? Do you have a Northern Party and the Federalists who are opposed to slavery and the Southern Party, Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans who support slavery? Or is it not that simple? Is it different? So what's the importance of the issue of slavery as we, um, as we move into 1800? It's a great question. It's actually really complicated. Uh, one would think that it would be simple to break down North and South, but actually, uh, the deeper that you look into attitudes about slavery in 1800, the more complicated it gets. So for example, um, in 1791, uh, Congress had uh, received some anti-slavery petitions. Benjamin Franklin, in the last year of his life, had become president of an abolition society in Pennsylvania, kind of led the charge in petitioning Congress to take some steps. And we almost had a dissolution of the Union then. South Carolina and Georgia, according to James Madison, lost their minds and, and were just so horrified that Congress would take up an issue that they believed should be left to the states, that there was a, a real kind of risk of, of uh, separation already before we even get to the real formation of the parties. So the founders, by and large, avoided talking about slavery too much in this time because it was such a hot button issue. But um, when you try to divide them out according to if you're Northern or Southern, are you pro or you're against, Jefferson is a Southerner who doesn't want to offend Southerners because he needs them to vote for him, but he's also committed to the idea of ending slavery. And he had been particularly vocal about that throughout the 1770s and 1780s. And so Jefferson has to walk this weird line of remaining true to what he had previously stated, that he is against slavery, and he will say that until his dying day. And yet, also, he doesn't want to offend too many Southerners by saying too much about it. Hamilton, in a fascinating way, kind of takes advantage of this by attacking Jefferson, both for being too racist and for being 
two abolitionists. So Hamilton plays on South Carolina and Georgia's fears of the abolition movement by telling them, you know, if you read Jefferson's book, Notes on the State of Virginia, he says a whole bunch of anti-slavery things. How can you vote for him? Maybe he'll, he'll take away your property rights. But Hamilton was also supposedly anti-slavery. So slavery is present, but in complicated ways. It's not, I wouldn't say, one of the major issues of the election. It's just one of the issues creating tension uh, and that is used uh, as a way of attacking political opponents. So, so it's, it's not a central issue. Maybe it becomes, in some ways you're suggesting, as the 19th century goes on, more important in sort of defining the political parties and de defining conflict. Because at least in principle, you have all the founders who are in principle anti-slavery. Whether or not they're acting on that or how they're acting on that is different, of course, given their context. But um, poor John Adams. He's, he's, he's sort of an orphan from the Federalist Party. He's saying everybody's turning toward Hamilton. But who actually ends up running in the election of 1800 for both parties? It's, it's Adams versus Jefferson, right? And, 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 and Adams gets the, the, the party support. He runs again to be president. Jefferson runs. Um, though these guys had been friends. They had been comrades in arms in the revolution. Later on, they restore their friendship. It's kind of a great American story, right? When they're old men and they say, look, we shouldn't die with, you know, misunderstandings and bitterness. Let's reconcile. Let's talk, try and talk this through. Great series of letters, the Adams yeah. Jefferson letters in light, late in life. But at this moment, they're pretty bitter rivals. Um, what's the election of 1800 like? You mentioned it was particularly nasty. What's it like? Um, what's it like in the newspapers? What's the campaigning like? What, what, are, what are Adams and Jefferson and Hamilton and Madison and these guys doing? And of course, we have to talk about what's Aaron Burr doing. Mm -hmm. All right, so election of 1800, John Adams is running for re-election as a Federalist. His uh, running mate is a South Carolinian named Pinckney. So once again, the, the regional divisions between the parties are not so clear. We have a Southerner running with Adams. Jefferson is running as his opponent, as a Democratic Republican, and Jefferson's running mate is Aaron Burr, who is in New York, openly campaigning. This is the first time in American presidential election history that, that somebody has gone door to door and organized and campaigned openly. And Alexander Hamilton, also in New York City, doing the same thing, um, campaigning for votes to support the Federalist Party. And uh, these men are kind of running this, this scorched earth <laughs> uh, newspaper attack uh, against one another. So if, I'll read you a, a couple of quotes to give, it, to give everybody a sense of what's going on. So the president of Yale supported John Adams. This is how uh, he described the future if Jefferson were to be elected. He said, quote, we would see our wives and daughters, the victims of legal prostitution. Thomas Jefferson gets elected. Uh, a con Connecticut newspaper wrote, if we elect Jefferson, we'll have a nation where murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. On Jefferson's side, things were equally personal and equally heated. Uh, so one Jefferson partisan wrote that John Adams was a rageful, lying, warmongerer, a repulsive pedant, a gross hypocrite who behaved neither like a man nor like a woman, but instead possessed a hideous hermaphroditical character. So, wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, lovely language that they use to attack one another then. So brutal campaign against uh, or between these two parties. Um, but by the time we get to the actual election, there's enough disunity even within these two parties that the election itself produces a, a really interesting dilemma. So you mentioned earlier that at this time period, um, whoever was runner up got to be vice president. The constitution didn't provide for there to be separate ballots for president and vice president. Now, this led to a situation where in the run up to the election, there were rumors of perhaps if, if it was close, perhaps the Federalists would, would try to support Aaron Burr over Thomas Jefferson. Perhaps 
Federalists would try to support Pinckney over Adams, because by this point, a lot of Federalists didn't like John Adams anymore. And everyone starts getting a little bit nervous about what's going to happen when all of those electoral ballots are opened and counted. Uh, and so that happens in February of 1801, actually. Uh, so this election seemingly has been going on forever by this point that people have been debating the outcome. And finally, February of 1801, they open the electoral ballots. And oh no, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr have the same number of electoral ballots. They both end up um, coming in with people, uh, electors, having voted equally for Jefferson and for Burr. Now, Burr had written letters to Jefferson saying, oh, you know, I support your candidacy for president. But, but Aaron Burr is a little bit of a slime ball, as those of you who have watched the Hamilton musical maybe know. And uh, so he was actually com comfortable with the idea of perhaps, hey, if enough people want me to be president instead of Jefferson, I'm not going to say no to that. And, and so this becomes a real fear that the election is going to be stolen in some sense by, by Aaron Burr, that the will of the people is going to be thwarted. Uh, and so the House of Representatives now gets to make that decision and vote for who they think should be uh, chosen president, elected president. So the Federalists have lost. It's not going to be, it's unlikely then if it goes to Congress that it's going to be Adams or Pinckney. It's going to be Jefferson or Burr. And we get one of the most remarkable events in American history. Talk about um, backroom dealing, right? We get Alexander Hamilton, the arch enemy of Thomas Jefferson. And in this letter that you had us look at from, from him to Harrison Gray Otis from 1800, he talks about why even though he really, he calls Jefferson evil, but he says he's the lesser of two evils because at least Thomas Jefferson has principles as bad as they are, at least he has principles and he has what he calls some probity of character. And in other words, he's sort of an honest guy. This Aaron Burr is unscrupulous. He's a total politician, just on the make for himself. So you have this remarkable moment, it looks like, where Hamilton organizes the Federalists in Congress. Since the lost cause to get Adams or Pinckney of his party voted, they, th they seem to throw their support, or at least behind Jefferson, or at least withdraw their support from their candidates, and then in internal politics of the Democratic Republican Party, see to it that Jefferson gets the votes in Congress because each vote, each state votes by state, right? So they count up, they total the number of representatives inside the state and whoever gets the majority in that state gets that state's vote, including in states that only have one representative, that one representative gets to cast the vote for them. So this is an amazing moment where Hamilton persuades some representatives to back his bitter arch rival, Jefferson. What he says, for the sake of the country. Yeah, it's an amazing moment. The letter that Hamilton writes to Harrison Gray Otis is just so profound to me uh, that Hamilton would say that at least Jefferson loves liberty. He might be too revolutionary. He loves liberty. He will desire something like order, orderly government. And he has integrity. We would be able to rely on agreements with Jefferson. He, he's a man of his word. Even if we don't like what he says, at least we know that he means what he says most of the time. And, and, and Burr doesn't. And so as a result of this, uh, no Federalists end up actually casting their votes for Jefferson, but there are enough backroom dealings that there are blank ballots cast, and, and it works out finally after 37 votes um, that Jefferson gets to, to win the election. I think it ha took place over more than a week. So there's a, there's a time in February, from February 11th until February 17th, where everybody's really biting their nails about the outcome of this election, for sure. This is amazing. Um, and the result of this, of course, is Jefferson's elected president. Yep. Um, his inaugural address. You know, we're, we're looking at sort of this amazingly divided political time, and we see a lot of these same kind of divisions in 2020. But we get this inaugural address, and there's some really famous lines in there. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit in the, in the moments we have left. Tell us about. Given, the, given this um, amazing partisan division, given this uh, 
unparalleled election, which we've never had since then in that way. In fact, we amend the Constitution so this doesn't happen again, right? Um, Jefferson has to figure out a way to try and somehow restore some common ground among not just the political parties, but among citizens in the country. And he tries to do that with his inaugural address. Just tell us what, what's really important about this address, and then how does he try and carry that out when he's president? Because he goes on to be president for two terms, eight years. Right. It really is a masterful address. And Jefferson was a, not a great public speaker. So, uh, you know, he made a point of walking from his boarding house to go and uh, be sworn in as president and give this speech. He dressed plainly. And apparently he spoke so softly that most of the audience couldn't hear him. But they printed the address. And so it was uh, distributed and, and all Americans were able to see Jefferson really taking a humble tone. I think you can see that particularly in the first paragraph and in the last, second to last paragraph. Jefferson says he can't believe the honor that's been um, placed on him. He shrinks before the magnitude of the undertaking that he's being asked um, as president to take on. And, and in the second to last paragraph, he says, I'm going to be wrong. I'm going to make mistakes. I shall often go wrong through defect of judgment. Um, and I ask for your indulgence for my errors. So he really is taking a humble position. I think that's important to note. Second of all, because Jefferson was a pretty good president and he didn't actually advocate burning Bibles or legalizing rape or anything like that, we now tend to look back and maybe downplay some of the Federalist concerns. But at the time, there was real fear. There were a lot of individuals who were genuinely afraid that a Thomas Jefferson presidency would be damaging to the future of America, and that perhaps Jefferson would take revenge for the way that his party had been oppressed, quite frankly, by the Alien and Sedition Acts. And so Jefferson, in the second paragraph of this document, outlines the principle that the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail that the will to be rightful must be reasonable, that the minority possess their equal rights, which equal law must protect and to violate would be oppression. In other words, he's very reassuring here. He's, he's letting everybody know, even if you didn't vote for me, you have rights. And the will of the majority has to be reasonable. It can't just be oppressive um, and, and, and target the minority. He, urges Americans to unite with one heart and one mind. This line always makes me cry. Let us restore to social intercourse that harmony and affection without which liberty and even life itself are but dreary things. When we're all fighting with one another, life is pretty dreary. If we have harmony and social affection, life is a lot more pleasant. And so he's encouraging the country to look to affection again, to become friends again, to look at what unifies us. Uh, and then toward the bottom of this second paragraph, Jefferson's possibly most famous three lines, he acknowledges that the French Revolution had created fear. Um, the agitation of the billows should reach even this distance and peaceful sh shore, that this should be felt and feared by some and less by others, and should divide opinions as to measures of safety. So he's acknowledging, yeah, you, you had a right to be afraid of what was going on. I, I'm not downplaying that. But every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have called by different names brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. And in his an, original version of the speech, Jefferson didn't capitalize those words. He wasn't even referring to the two parties. He was saying, we all agree that America must have Republican elements and that America must have Federalist elements, that there must be a somewhat strong national government, but it mustn't overrun the voices of the people in the states. And he was urging Americans to go back to their, uh, the original sources of the American Revolution, to that early unity, to those fundamental principles that we can agree on and to build from there together. Yeah. And as you say, this was this this speech would have been widely published in newspapers across the United States. So a lot of Americans would have either read it for themselves or had other people read it to them. Jefferson obviously knew that. And he thought this was a moment to, um, in his humility, make that sort of argument to them. Yeah, absolutely. He's he's reassuring. He's urging to unity. 
and he lays out in his uh, the rest of his address a lot of the same principles that he'd already laid out to Elbridge Gerry, the moderate Federalist, a couple years earlier. He says, I believe in upholding the Constitution, having a small federal government, low taxes, uh, small military, and Jefferson is uh, true to his word. Those are exactly the foundations of the presidency that he will um, preside over. Yeah, and it, it seems to me, and I'm just thinking about, you know, you know, you know what does this, what lesson from history can we learn from this? At least one to my mind comes is that, you know, e even after deep political divisions and a really nasty election campaign, um, that, that Americans did come back together. They could come back together because they, they, both sides ended up understanding that they really did believe in Republican government, right? They really did believe in consent of the governed, that the people should rule, the people make a decision. You might, you might think it's completely wrong, but you really do have to abide by it, even under these tricky constitutional situations that, um, that we have to have faith that, that the people will make the right decision. And even if they don't, that, that there might be the right decision next time, right? And so the Federalists continue, they continue their struggle, like sort of become eclipsed, I think, by, the, by Jefferson's party over time, right? Um, but that, that uh, it, this faith that if we share certain common principles, um, we can come back together even after these bitter times with some time to heal. It takes some time, I'm sure, for the Federalists to get over this loss, for John Adams to get over this loss. It takes a lot of time for he and Jefferson to come back together personally, right? So, um, yeah, it just strikes me that, and of course, this election sort of realigns the country and gives Jefferson's party dominance for quite a long time. Jefferson gets two terms, right? Then Madison gets two terms, then Monroe has his terms, and they're all sort of, this is the era uh, of, of government, of uh, the presidency being in those hands. But, but the Federalists learn, you know, they call it the Revolution of 1800, right? Because sort of the first time, as you said, that um, power is transferred peacefully after a bitter contested election. And that's a real, uh, that's an unusual fact in history, I think. That's the first time in modern history, I think it would be safe to say, yeah, that, that there's been a peaceful transition of power, that there wasn't a violent revolution here. Yeah, I, I, you know, just thinking in, in 2020, um, no matter how bitter partisanship gets to, for us to remember that, that that idea was established back in 1800. And that's an idea that's been an American idea and habit and really powerful in keeping the country together um, since 1800 until now. Yeah. So, well, Cara, thank you so much. The time has flown by. Wonderful conversation. Uh, there's so much we could say about the election of 1800, but man, how many, how many similarities it has to today with political parties and important public figures fighting with each other and the media on each other's sides. But, but uh, in the end, the, the president sort of trying to reunite the country and restore those fundamental principles of America and bring people back together along those lines. So uh, really interesting insights and possibilities here. Thank you so much for that. Really My do pleasure. appreciate the conversation. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, thanks again, of course, to Missouri Humanities for their um, wonderful partnership in sponsoring and promoting this evening's conversation. Thanks to you for joining us. Um, you know, Missouri Humanities offers a lot of uh, virtual opportunities to learn about German, Native American, and Civil War heritage. Um, so throughout this upcoming year. So please do check them out at uh, MissouriHumanities.org for uh, connecting to the people and places and ideas that, that shape society. They're doing great work there and I encourage you to check that out. And also to learn more about Ashbrook, check us out at ashbrook.org. Check out our resources for teachers at tahteachingamericanhistory.org as well. We really encourage you to, they're wonderful resources for students, for teachers, for children, grandchildren, people who might be still homeschooling and this coming this fall. Uh, there's wonderful resources at tah.org. And to learn about the Ashbrook Center, ashbrook.org. Uh, thank you again for joining us. We really do appreciate it. We, we, there will be a, a link and a recording to this. We encourage you to spread it far and wide. We love to have folks join us even just watching afterwards. We'll be continuing this discussion next Tuesday night with uh, another webinar on another really critical moment in American history. 
Abraham Lincoln and the election of 1860. And the following week will be another Tuesday, the 18th of August. It will be Ronald Reagan and the election of 1980, focusing on critical elections and the statesmen involved in those elections and what they can show us about our times today. So thank you so much. It's our belief at Ashbrook as always that we can learn from history, that it gives us light uh, to shine on our current circumstance, to put it in historical perspective, and as always to renew our understanding of America and our principles. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our programs, resources, and free documents collections at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org.